Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome back to another broadcast of In the Trenches. I'm excited to welcome onto the call today Michael Zabersky, who is the CEO of Consulting Success. He's advised organizations like Financial Times, Dow Jones, RBC, Panasonic, and many others launch new products into global markets. And now in his role as the CEO of Consulting Success, he helps consultants up their consulting game and figure out ways to generate new clients, increase their fees, win more proposals, and grow their business. I sit down with Michael to discuss what it takes to grow a thriving consultancy. We specifically focus on the topic of the initial consultation call and what it takes to turn a conversation into a new client. So we cover topics like what are the questions that you should be asking on the initial consultation call? What should you be listening for? What's the type of conversation you should have? And how do you turn that conversation, that initial call, into a new paying client, a high paying client? We also talk about this idea of ROI pricing or value-based pricing and why it's so critical that you don't charge by the hour, but that you actually take a look at the project and outline what the end state benefit will be, what the value will be to the client, and then you establish your fees from there. Because ultimately, that's what the client's going to be listening to. And if you lead with an hourly rate, they're immediately going to think of you as an expense. And that's my biggest takeaway, I think, from this call. It might sound a little bit like common sense, but I think Michael has an incredible way of elucidating these topics in a way that I found really useful. I've already implemented this stuff since I interviewed Michael and have gotten surprisingly good results. So I'm really excited to share this call with you today. Without further ado, let's get to the conversation. So Michael, I want to hear a little bit about how you got into what you're doing today in specifically helping consultants start and grow their consultancy, I I suppose, for lack of a better way to describe it. What led you to that? I know your background, you've, you've started some businesses in the past, but I'm really curious to dive into that a little bit before we get into the ground-based tactics for growing a consultancy. Yeah, sounds good. We can kind of do it at warp speed because I've been building uh, consulting businesses now for over 18 years, a bit of a ground to cover there. But I started off actually out of high school with my cousin and business partner, Sam, still to this day. We started a consulting business. It was web design and development. Sam was doing the, the design, the development. I was doing the marketing, the client interaction, the biz dev. That just kind of gave us the initial experience of running a business. And from there, we went on to start another consultancy, which this time was focused much more on branding and design consulting. I ended up going over to Japan, opening up a branch office for our company over there. Spent uh, five, six years there working with very large organizations like Panasonic and Dow Jones Japan, uh, Financial Times Japan, Omron, Sumitomo, a whole bunch of others, helping those companies to communicate their brand to English language markets. And then upon returning to North America, started another consulting business this time uh, focusing on lead generation for professional services firms. So we worked with a lot of law firms and financial advisors and insurance companies and other consultancies who wanted to generate more leads. All of that experience kind of combined got me to a place where I recognized, you know, I want to share like what I'm learning with others. And I think I've learned about what success looks like, but I've certainly learned about what failure or mistakes or what I just call them lessons learned are right? The ups and downs. And so uh, we started a blog and that's kind of how Consulting Success was born. It was a place where I was writing articles and sharing my stories from the front lines and the trenches of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the audience kind of built from there and we started to get more and more community. There was no monetization plan. There was really no idea of a business behind it at that moment. We just knew that we wanted to start something online and as a way to share with others. And when did you give us some context of time? How long has that been going? How long have you been doing that for? So consulting success now is almost 10 years. Wow. Okay. And you started by blogging. And have you consistently blogged over that decade? Yeah. So definitely. I mean, the, in the early days, it was just articles. Then it became podcast content, like audio, video, We started doing all kinds of surveys and studies. So we do a consulting fee study every year. We do a marketing for consultants survey and study each year. And our our audience has grown. You know, we now have over 33,000 consultants that are part of our community in terms of being on our our list and many more than that coming to the website each month. That's awesome. So I'm curious how, when you started this and, and kind of how you work with consultants, like, Let's just dive into this because I'm really curious. We had a conversation offline a few weeks ago and I found your advice really helpful for me as I've done a bit of consulting work, some advisory work and, and just started a coaching program this past year. And I'm really curious how you approach this conversation with your clients. 
where's the first place you start with somebody who's looking to start a consultancy? Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's a really great question, right? And, and it really does depend on what stage you're at. So our work has over these last, you know, nine, 10 years in terms of working with consultants has really been helping them to grow their businesses. And depending on what stage they're at and what their goals are, I mean, some people have reach out to us because they've been consulting for several years or in some cases, many years. They're very good at what they do. They have some clients, but they just have typically got to where they are because they've been in the position to receive referrals or introductions and their network has provided that runway for them. But then that kind of starts to dry up. And so now they're looking for help with their marketing. So they might be later on in the stage in terms of their business, but they're still early stage in terms of their marketing. And so we help them to put a marketing system and process in place that will generate leads for them consistently and really help them to build a pipeline. Others reach out when they're just getting started. You know, they're typically making that transition from a corporate environment. They may have worked as part of the government, a Fortune 500 organization, a nonprofit, a startup, whatever it is. But they, again, have a real expertise. That is one thing that all of our clients share is that they are experts. I mean, they really know how to provide value for the marketplace and for their clients, but they want to realize their true potential. They don't want to work a job anymore. They want to be their own boss. They want to have the freedom and flexibility. They want to have unlimited income earning potential. So their skill set is very good and it's very deep in a specific area, but they're looking for a clear path and plan to take action on to build their consulting business. And so people in that situation, really what we're looking at is helping them to go through and establish four pillars into their business. The first is ideal client clarity, getting very clear around who is your ideal client. Because without that knowledge or without that understanding, without that, that sight, it's very hard for anything else to work. Once you've developed that, then the second step is what we call magnetic messaging. And this is really developing that message, often known as a value proposition or a unique selling proposition or a USP, where you can quickly communicate what it is that you do and what value you bring and what differentiates you from others in the marketplace, but done in a way that gets the attention interest of your ideal clients. They want to raise their hands. So they actually want to have a conversation with you. You can then apply that to your website, to your LinkedIn profile, to conversations, to marketing materials. And because you now have clarity around who your ideal client is, you can develop messaging that will be very specific and will really resonate with that ideal client and align with their interests and the solutions that they're, they're looking for in their life or in their business. The third is then what we call ROI positioning. And this really looks at how you take all of your experience and expertise and how you package it and position it and place value on it, price it and present it in a way that works for you in terms of the lifestyle that you want to have, your income goals, the business model that you're going to use, but also, and just as importantly, works for your ideal clients. So it's about setting up your offers and your packages in a way that it's easy for buyers to say yes to. A lot of consultants encounter the situation where it can take them a lot of time to kind of go through the sales cycle and there's lots of delays and so forth. So what we want to help people to do is to shorten that uh, considerably so that they can really enroll clients into their service offerings as quickly as possible. And then finally, it's what we call the marketing engine. So this is really, again, back to that system and process that you put into place that allows you to generate leads more consistently because without that, then you end up just relying on referrals in your network and while some people, again, can find that that will last them for a period of time, inevitably what happens is that kind of starts to dry up and then they're kind of left scratching their head, looking at their screen quite often, wondering, you know, when that next inquiry is going to come in. But true success is not about hope marketing, right? True success is really being in a position where you can pick and choose which clients you're going to work with and, and always feeling confident and comfortable that that next client is, is there for you. And to give some context, because I want to dive into probably each one of these four pillars, at least briefly, I'm curious, the types of right now in your program, the people that you are consulting with your clients, or who they've been over the last few years or so, what spaces have they been predominantly in? I'm kind of curious to get like a lay of the land of who you've worked with. Yeah. So, I mean, if you name an, an industry, it's likely that we've worked with a consultant in that industry. We have consultants who are in pharmaceutical research, nonprofit, marketing, sales, innovation, branding, environment, fashion, fitness, health, manufacturing, food and beverage, finance, <laughs> you know, the list goes on because here, here, awesome. here's the thing, Tom, right? right? We're not going to teach our clients anything about their own area of expertise. So if we have a client that is an expert in helping uh, large pharmaceutical organizations launch and run and successfully complete 
high level, massive research projects. Like that's not my, my skill set. That's not my expertise. And I'm not going to teach them anything about that that they don't know about. So they have that down pat. They're not looking for help in that area because they've already developed it over many years. What they're looking for help with is the other side of the business, right? How to actually put that marketing system in, in place, how to increase their fees with confidence, how to win more proposals, how to structure their business so they can start to create more leverage and more scale so that even if they're just a solo independent consultant or if they're a small firm, they're able to, to grow to a level that is meaningful for them in a way that works for their lifestyle and their goals and so forth. Cool. So let's, let's break each one of these things down because that's a lot of ground I'd love to cover because everything you said was, uh, I find, I personally very interesting and I really want to dig into it, but we'll be, I know we'll be a little time constricted because this will probably take days to really get after, but let's break down the four pillars. You said the first part you start with is ideal client clarity. So talk me through the process of how you approach that with clients. Like when I'm a professional or I'm looking to start a consultancy, how do I break that down? How do I decide what is an ideal client versus just like, oh, these are people in this industry that maybe I could help or work with? Like, how do you guys approach that problem set? Yeah, definitely. And so I'm happy to go through this. As you mentioned, time, you know, will be a little bit of a limiting factor here. We actually just today, this morning, published a guide on becoming a successful consultant, kind of starting a consulting business. I don't know, I think it's like 3,500 words or something like that. It's pretty extensive. So if anyone wants to kind of get a bit more detail than we may be able to go into here. You can head over to uh, consultingsuccess.com and just type in guide to becoming a consultant. You'll, you'll likely find that. But okay, so ideal client clarity, right? There's several factors here that are really important for people to consider. The low hanging fruit is look at where is your expertise, right? Where have you been able to create results in the past? And this doesn't need to be you as a consultant or as a independent professional. It, it can be as your time as an employee. But where are you confidently able to demonstrate and deliver results for people. That's a really good starting point. Then the next thing that you want to consider is your enjoyment. Like, do you enjoy that? Because life is too short to do things that we don't enjoy. We never know what's going to happen. So we might as well be spending our time doing things that we enjoy. Plus, if you decide to get into a specific area, whether again, whether it's in consulting or otherwise, make sure that you like it because you're probably going to have to talk a lot about it, think a lot about it, create a lot of content around it. And so you want to make sure that it's, again, an area that resonates with you and that you feel good about. Then the next is kind of market demand, right? Is there demand? Is there potential for you in that area? Because if there isn't, you might love it. But if there's no one that's going to be willing to invest in it, then it's probably not going to be a good use of your time to spend time building up in that area. And then as part of that, there's kind of several other variables that are important to consider that help you to gain an advantage. So do you have considerably better results than others in this area? Have you been spending many years developing your skills in this area? Do you have a unique process or, or methodology you know, that has enabled people to get better results? These are all things that could give you an advantage. So you want to kind of look at this landscape. These are just a few of them, right? But when you start to think through these, they can really help you to gain better clarity around who your ideal client is. And then you can get very specific, right? You can look at geography. You can look at what is the actual title of the person? What size organization do they work within? What is the revenue or, or employee count? What is the industry? And when you start to get clarity around those things, now you can actually go out and do a little test, go onto LinkedIn or find another list and search to see who comes up. You might find there's no people that match that kind of criteria or you might find that there's plenty. But now you can start to identify, are there ideal clients in that area? And do, you know, is there a good match between the ideal client criteria that you selected and your own skill set, your own background, your own kind of advantage and you know do you think that you're going to enjoy doing that and then the next step after that would be actually to actually go out and validate to make sure that your assumptions your hypothesis around that there is market potential and there is demand and you know there is a need that matches your skill set and, and experience that, that actually exists wow okay i mean that's that's good stuff so anybody listening you may have to go back and listen to this podcast again to take all the notes because man each one of those i think is is worth considering or diving into in more depth but what I want to actually move into is the magnetic messaging, because I think well, some of this will be a little, uh, we'll kind of come back to maybe that ideal client stuff as we kind of go through this. So you, you've gone through that process. You've thought about what's your skill set? How does this impact you know, the potential clients that you want to work with? Do you enjoy it? Is there that market, marketplace for this service? And actually testing it out and getting some validation. And then you mentioned, uh, and your second pillar is magnetic messaging. So developing the value proposition or USP, what you bring to the table, what differentiates you, what gets people to raise their hands to work with you. So I'm particularly interested in how you do this, especially if like, say, somebody's listening to this is like, 
well, I'm in a space that's like really boring or it's, or maybe there's a lot of people in this space. How do you set yourself apart in a way that actually matters or how do you differentiate yourself in a way that matters to the ideal client? Two words, be specific. I like that. So let's, let's elaborate on that. <laughs> yeah. No, worry, I'm not going to leave you hanging there. I just want to really make that point because it's so important. So this is what most people do, right? Most people say, I help businesses grow. That's their messaging, right? And you might have some variation of that, but anyone can say that. There's nothing unique about that. What's happened in the environment, the society that we all live in these days, right? The vast majority of us, we are surrounded by options. We are surrounded by offers. We are surrounded by advertisements. We're surrounded by noise. And so the reaction that most of us have is to pretty much not pay attention to any of that stuff. The only things that really get our attention these days are things that stand out, things that are specific, that grabs us in. So with your messaging, if you're essentially saying, yeah, I help businesses grow, there's nothing there. There's nothing to hook people into. And that's why it's so important that you do the first pillar properly first, because once you understand who your ideal client is, now you can actually create a, a message that will resonate with them. So if you're helping accountants, right, or accounting firms, you can now address them in your messaging. Instead of saying, I help businesses grow, you can start off by saying, I help accountants too. And then what do you help them to do? What specifically are you able to do? And this is important. It's not just about what you are able to help them to do. It should address the problem that they have. So what is the challenge? What is the problem that accountants have? What is the goal that they are working towards? What is meaningful for them? What does success look like? What is valuable? in their minds, not just yours. Now make sure that you include that in your messaging. Most often people talk about, and especially consultants, right? that's my world, that's what I know about, so I'll just I'll kind of speak to that. What most consultants do is they talk a lot about inputs. They talk a lot about things that they are going to do for the client. The clients don't care about what you're going to do. Clients want the output, they want the result, they want the outcome, they want the value. So in your messaging, start off by identifying who you help and then talk about how you help them but not just about what you do, but actually how, like what is the result that they're going to get from that? What is the benefit? Why should they care? And when you're speaking their language, right, they're going to peak up. You're going to get their attention. Now they might become interested. The third component of this formula is why. Why should they choose you? What is unique? What is different about you? So you could just say, I help accountants to grow their business. Well, that's okay, right? If I'm an accountant, I may kind of be interested in that, but it's not that unique. But if you say that I help accountants to grow their business using a, a five-stage proven process that increases lead flow and profits significantly, like I'm a little bit more interested now, right? I'd want to know about what is this proven process? Like, what does that look like? Now, if I added on and said something like guaranteed at the end of that, I'd be even more interested. You have a guarantee. Like, how, how can you guarantee more lead flow, right? How can you guarantee increasing profits? If I'm an accountant, that's probably what I want to know. So... The why part, there's many different factors that we teach our clients to kind of look at, like several criteria, years of experience, track record, companies that you've worked with, and a whole bunch of others. But when you assess all of these different advantages that you likely already have as an asset within your business or within you, then it's about conveying and communicating those. And so when you kind of put those three things together, it becomes very clear to a buyer who is an ideal client that they probably should have a conversation with you. But if you're not hitting on any of those, if you're going too general, then your messaging is just going to get lost among all the other noise out there. One question I have on this before we move on to the next piece, because I thought that was like perfect, like great framework. Anybody can sit down and use that. And it's probably worth revisiting for anybody listening to it. I know I will be revisiting this formula and thinking about it. Like, am I really speaking as specifically as possible in a way that matters? But is, is this question is, what if you do, I won't say a number of things. What if you are consulting like in a specific area? but you have the ability to say consult in maybe some different areas. Maybe they're connected in some way, shape or form, but it's like a different type of customer. Does that make sense? Because I, I can get in more detail and give you an example. Well, so what, what I'm hearing you say is what if you serve more than one market or what if you have more than one service offering? Right, exactly. What, what's, your, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, so uh, this is the reason why most people have very vague and general messaging is because it requires some hard choices, like some hard decisions, right, to be made. So, you know, specialization or, or being specific is not easy, right? You can't be all things to all people. But that's why when you really create a message that is very specific to your ideal client, you will stand head and shoulders above the competition because no one else has the courage to really be 
specific. Most people focus a lot more on what they stand to lose than what they actually stand to gain. So in this situation, I would say, think about where does the greatest source of business come from? Or who really are your ideal clients? You know, do an 80-20 analysis to figure out. And most likely you'll find out that, yeah, I have three different ideal clients, but there's probably one or two of them that actually are the cream of the crop. They're the highest value. So if you can update your messaging to really focus on the highest value service offering or highest value client, that'll help you right there. And other times you might find that you'll have let's say a little bit more general messaging on your website that might speak to, I work with accountants and insurance brokers as an example. But then in your marketing, when you target accounts, you're going to make sure that your messaging only speaks to accounts when you're going directly to them. So that's one way to kind of work around that. But in terms of service offerings, many people have like, yeah, five or 10 different service offerings and they want to try and say everything under the sun to the marketplace because they're, they're scared, right? They're afraid that they might leave something out and somehow that might mean that they're going to lose opportunities in business, but it's actually the exact opposite. The more specific that you can be, the more that you can subtract what is not required so that you can really just leave the highest value point of contact or kind of point of information. That's what will stick. That's what will get the attention and interest of your ideal clients. So dovetailing on that, that's really useful. I guess my question also then is, is thinking in the context of both, say, this ideal client, especially if we were focusing on, say, the highest value client, but also on whatever, maybe you mentioned one of the things is like, what do you do and do you enjoy doing it? And maybe the service market fit or the product market fit, and one of those ways maybe is a way to think about it. But it's like, what if you have an offer and you're, you're a service-based professional, you're an advisor or something like that, and you want to work in a specific way with a specific clientele. Like, okay, so coaching, for example. Not everybody wants coaching that I can think of per se, or so a lot of people come and want some sort of implementation work done. So how important is it to think about the deliverable itself in the context of this, in your messaging and positioning? Yeah, so the deliverable itself is, is really not that important. No one goes out and says, I want coaching or I want a training program. What people want is the result that they get from those things. This is a really common mistake that I have observed over the years where consultants or coaches will talk a lot about like their program and their process and buyers don't care about that stuff. Like, yes, it's important. Yes, it, it impacts their decision, but it's a very, very small percentage of that decision kind of making process. What they care most about is, can this person or this company help me to get the result that I want? How confident do I feel that that is the case? Like they really know how to get me from where I am to where I want to be or to solve the problem that I'm, that I'm having. And do I like them? Do I feel good about them? Is there a cultural fit? Those are much more important than, yeah, there's a 10 step process that you're going to go through. And even though you don't want to go through it, here's what it looks like, right? You need to follow up because this is what we've done before. Yes, it's important to communicate if you have that kind of process, but it's not what people care most about. They're not going out and saying, I want to buy your deliverable they're buying their, the results. Yeah, that's awesome. Great, great point of clarification because I feel like I, a lot of people ask me about that too and I find it's kind of focusing on the features versus the benefits, that kind of conversation. And it always leads down this path where it's like, I just don't think anybody really cares about that. But that's a really good distinction. I really appreciate that. Your next piece is ROI positioning. So packaging, pricing, and this piece. So taking that messaging and, and we'll kind of think about the deliverable maybe to some degree, but maybe not. Can you elaborate on this ROI positioning. Yeah, I mean, most independent professionals charge by the hour or by the day. Even when they're using a project kind of base rate, they still arrive at that value of the project based on hours and days. That's a broken model. That's a model that really means you're leaving a lot of money on the table. So ROI positioning is all about understanding and identifying and then being able to communicate the ROI, the value for the buyer. And that's not the value that you see or that you believe it's the value and the ROI that the buyer themselves can see. And so this comes from, first of all, knowing how to have a really meaningful, what we call, you know, meaningful consulting sales conversation. It's really about knowing what questions to ask, how to ask them, how to get really deep in that conversation so you can extract and identify that value that the buyer is thinking about. And then being able to pretty much put it on a platter and get the buyer's buy-in and so that they essentially say, yeah, that's exactly what I'm looking for. And that is a priority for me. And yes, this is why it's so important. This is what we're going to be able to do when we solve that problem. And here's the value and here's the dollars associated to it, or, or here's how our uh, performance will improve, or this is how our morale will improve, or this is how 
our market share will change. You go deep into those kinds of conversations. Now you can start to really uncover the value and be able to demonstrate greater ROI. And so once you've done that, then buyers are much more willing to invest with you rather than just to pay you. And that's the big difference is that the standard kind of average independent professional will think about fees and will think about kind of their pricing and they'll, they'll present it in a way that the buyer just looks at them like a cost. It's like, hey, well, how much is this going to cost me to get what you just told me about? Well, when a buyer looks at it like a cost, they see you as an expense. They're not excited to spend that money. But when you get into a really deep, meaningful sales conversation and you've identified that value and you've communicated it back to the buyer and your prospective client, and they now see it as an investment because there's a return associated to it, they're much more excited to invest, right? When you think about when you're investing money into some kind of an investment, whether it's like the equity markets into a house, whatever, there's a sense or a feeling of excitement around that because you're willing to put money in because you believe that you're going to get more back from that. It's not just money all the time. It might be other things like less stress or more happiness or greater performance or whatever it might be. But you're excited to, to make that investment because you know there's a greater return coming. And that's the opportunity for independent professionals as well, for consultants, is to see that if you can get to that place in, in a conversation with a the buyer, they will actually be willing to invest more money with you and they'll be more excited and happier because they see it as an investment, not just as a cost. With those conversations, what are some, I suppose, strategies or what process do you use to extract what is of most value? Is there a specific process you have your clients go through or, or when they're building their consultants, there's specific ways to engage in that conversation to get the most out of it and then to be able to provide the solution in a way that is really appealing? Yeah, I mean, the quick answer is it's, it's just a conversation. It doesn't need to be more complicated or, you know, set up to, to be something kind of secretive or, or tricky. It's about a conversation. The problem that, that most people have and that they make is that they ask a question and go on to the next question very quickly. So they're only ever staying at the, at the surface level. Where, and that's what the novice, the early stage you know, consultant or independent professional will do. But the more skilled, the more knowledgeable, the wiser professional will know that they need to slow things down. That when you ask a question, you don't just go on to the next one, you go deeper into that same question. Tell me more about that. Why is that the case? What does that look like for you? Why is that so important to you? Is that a priority? So you're asking these questions and you're getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, which means you're actually getting to the core. You're getting to find out what the buyer really cares about, what they really want. They're, not, they're going beyond the level, kind of the surface level where every other consultant or every other independent professional or all your competitors typically are. They're just kind of going through the motions to you who's now having a really deep and meaningful conversation with a buyer that no one else has, has had with them. You're asking them questions that they never even considered before. And the value starts to exchange right there and then because you, know, you are asking them these questions in a different way and you're going deeper. They now have to respond to them in a different way. They actually have to think through what they're saying. And so the importance, the value becomes crystallized for them as well. So yes, I mean, back to your question, Tom, we provide our clients with a whole list and a script and a template and a whole training on, on how to have these conversations. There are certain questions that we use and recommend going through. But what's most important that I would hope anyone listening to this could get from it is to slow things down, right? Really try to identify and uncover the value that the buyer cares about. And to do that, though, I'm curious, like, do you start with asking things like, where are you at? Like, what's the problem? What are the challenges? And then like, where do you want to go? Like, what are your goals? Like, is it just, is it essentially kind of that generic, but maybe like uh, whittled down? Because I'm, I'm really curious about how best to facilitate that, this particular conversation. And I ask that because I have done a lot of calls with a lot of different people for, and I don't even know what my, my rate is of people who then we end up working together. But what I noticed when I first got started was, sometimes the conversation moving into technicalities and things like that, which I'm sure is like, you don't want it to go there. So I'm just curious, like, besides having the conversation, which I think is valuable information, and what's your thoughts on like how to, I suppose, position this particular conversation? And when you have it, you extract all the value. Do you usually, what do you recommend, like scheduling a follow-up call to provide the solution? So like you have some space in between, or is it on that same call, We'd say, well, here's what we can do for you. Here's how we'd work together. Like, how do you typically recommend people structure that piece? Yeah, so two you know, separate questions there that you're asking, uh, both good. So the first one is in terms of the actual conversation from a high level, yes. I mean, you're, you want to explore with them where they want to go, right? Like, what does success look like for them? You want to really then understand what is the challenge that they're having in getting there themselves right now. In that conversation, it should be pretty clear 
to both parties and you actually want to help them to try and almost not buy from you. If you can help them to figure out that they don't need you and they can do it themselves, they probably don't need you. But in the conversation, usually what will come up as you're exploring is that in fact, like, no, they've been trying to get to the result they want for quite some time. They clearly don't have the knowledge or skill set or resources or guidance they need to accomplish their goals. And so then you want to start working through that and you want to uncover why is it so important for them to do that now, right? Is this a priority? What happens if you don't do this right now? Okay. And if you do do this, what does that mean for you? How will things be better off? Okay. What specifically is holding you back from getting there right now? What have you tried so far? So you're going through all these kind of different steps to really, first of all, identify where they want to go and then look at, you know, what's holding them back from getting there right now? What have, what have they tried and what are they looking for help with? And if you can figure out, if you can identify what they want, what is the result they want and what is not working for them, and you have a way to get them from where they are to where they want to be, then it becomes a very easy transition to just offer that and say, hey, you know, would it be helpful if you had this, you know, lay it out. Like this is kind of the res- what they've just told you. And most of them are say, yeah, that would be terrific. Like that would be amazing. That's exactly what I need. You know, that's interesting because that's what we do with our clients. That's exactly what, what we could help you with and lay it out, tell them what it's all about. And they'll most likely say, yeah, like that sounds really great. Is that a good fit? Do you think that sounds like a good fit? Yeah, it sounds like be a really good fit. So that from a high level, right, is kind of what the conversation looks like. In terms of how do you then go about, like, what is the next step? That really depends on the situation. So if you're selling a product or service that is $5,000, $10,000, $15,000, like you might just even be, be doing that from one phone call, right? It, just, it depends on how much work has gone into that relationship before you even jumped on the call? Like, are, have you done a really good job of establishing your authority, your credibility? Have you demonstrated results? Have you done all that stuff before they even got on the call? Because that'll really influence, right, how they feel about you and working together when they're on that call with you. And then if you're at that kind of price point, uh, you might not even require another phone call or another meeting. But we have clients that are selling, you know, like their offerings are anywhere from, let's say, 5000 up to $5 million, right? We have clients that, that land six-figure deals consistently. And so you're in the vast majority of cases, you're not going to sell a six-figure or a seven-figure contract to a large organization or a government agency or a nonprofit with one phone call. It's going to require probably a few meetings and several interactions. And so in that situation, you know, your first call or your first conversation would really be to go through this sales process to kind of go through understanding where they are right now, right? Get a lay of the land. And the key goal is, is qualification. It's like, can I help this person? Do I want to help this person? Like, does it feel like it's going to be a good cultural fit and enjoyable to work together? And then if you can help them, then the next step would be to figure out when you set up that next meeting. And typically you want to do that as quickly as possible. And you want to make sure that you do that before you end that first meeting. I love it. This is uh, fantastic. I, I think anybody listening to this can actually use it. And I know I'm, I've been taking a ton of notes. So this last piece I wanted to hit on was the pillar number four, where you guys kind of focus on that marketing engine. So generating leads consistently. How do you approach that? And like, what are some of the things we need to look for to do that? And that piece there that I think is most interesting is the consistent part. Yeah. So this will depend on like everyone's different, right? We have some clients who first of all, already are generating some leads from some source. And so we'll just look at how do we help them to do more of that. As an example, we have people who who speak or we have people that that write. Like we've had clients who have, you know, been writing content for years. They have a, a, even a small list, but they're never getting any leads from it. And then all of a sudden we'll show them how to change up their call to action, how to be more specific, how to make a, a clear offer, and they go from no leads to like actually we just had a one client we did this uh, with last week and had a call with this guy and he's like, Michael, we have to actually stop our, our, our offers right now because we're getting in a day with too many inquiries and we need to like kind of firm up our, our sales process. So that's a good thing, right? But we've had several people like that. But we have others who come in and they have no marketing going on at all, right? There's no source of leads. They're just getting things started. And in that case, the question to always ask is what is the most direct path to getting in front of your ideal clients? And so for some that might be going to an event, for others that might be looking to speak, or it might be advertising. But for the vast majority of our clients, regardless of where they are in the world, 
LinkedIn is a really good starting point because you can very quickly do a search and identify ideal clients. You can connect with them. You can actually start creating a relationship with them in under 24 hours. And that's what we have observed and seen and helped people to do. So you can create a lot of consistency around that because there's a lot of people on a platform like LinkedIn. What we focus on doing in, in everything is on building relationships. A lot of people don't recognize about the consulting business is that it's a little bit different from a consumer kind of uh, facing business or even if you're coaching or like working with massage therapists or, or other ways. The consulting business, you know, you're typically selling to other organizations, whether it's nonprofit or a government agency or, you know, Fortune 500 or 100 or even a small to mid-sized business, but they're, they're businesses, they're companies. So sales sales can be a little bit longer, but more importantly, the dollar value of what you're selling is typically higher. And so that does require you to really focus on establishing a relationship first. And there's a process and system that we use to do that in LinkedIn, where you essentially identify your ideal clients. You then connect with them. Once you connect with them, then you start to engage in a conversation. And again, this can happen very, very quickly. Like within 24 hours of launching and starting to build this marketing engine, people are actually getting connected with their ideal clients, not just with people. It's not just about numbers. It's not, like, not about how many likes or fans or connections you have, but it's about quality. So getting connected with the right people and then being able to start having conversations with those people and then being able to move those conversations off of LinkedIn or off of any other platform that you're on into an actual phone conversation or an in-person meeting. And then be able to generate opportunities from that and proposals and winning deals. So you know you go through those step by step by step, Tom, but the, the key is that once you've done that, now there's ways to start to automate that process or ways to create more leverage in it. And the consistency part comes from doing it consistently. But the nice thing with platforms like this is again that you can input or you can connect some elements of automation or of outsourcing so that you don't need to spend tons of your time every single day doing it. A lot of the, the heavy lifting can be done for you once you've actually created the right marketing engine or put the right system and process into place. And so it's important to always have your foot on the pedal, right? To always make sure that even if you're bringing on new clients and you're, you're, you're kind of reaching close to capacity because you're busy, that never means that you should stop doing, doing your marketing. So ensuring that you're always doing outreach, right? You're always getting in front of new prospective clients. You're always building your pipeline. That's really the key to having consistent lead flow. I love it. So one question I have is I get a lot of uh, messages on LinkedIn and I feel like a lot of them are garbage. They're really like, I find them, a lot of these things are generic or strange or, and this is probably a case of people not doing this well. How do you typically encourage people like if they're using something like LinkedIn like what does it look like to for that first message if you are using this kind of process or system to you know hopefully get new clients like how do you how do you typically do the approach so it doesn't even have to be LinkedIn right it can be anything in marketing here's the thing treat your message treat whatever you're doing like you're actually starting to build a relationship with someone ask yourself could I actually say what I'm saying right now if I was meeting this person at a networking event, right, or at a business event. And in most cases, like you never would, because most people are kind of ingrained or they, or they learn this quote unquote marketing approach where it's all transactional. It's all like, hey, here's what, what I do. Do you want to buy my stuff? It's like, no, I don't. And I don't even know you. Who are you? Like, get out of here. You would never go up to someone at an event and say, hi, nice to meet you. My name is Michael. Do you want to buy my stuff? It's really great. I've been doing this for so many years. Like, forget about you, but you want to buy my stuff? You wouldn't do that. So why are you doing it online, right? Online is just about leverage. It's about global scale, about ease of, of access. But just because you have that ease of access and you can create that leverage doesn't mean that you should uh, forego what relationships are all about. So the best starting point is to really think about what would I say to this person if I was meeting them in person? Like what language would I use that would make them feel comfortable? Could I say something like, hi, um, you know, Sarah, uh, saw that we share some similar connections or we're both based in this area. I was just looking at your work. Looks like you've accomplished a lot. I'd love to connect with you. Would that sound a little bit more authentic? Probably. <laughs> and then, of course, you have to reinforce that with a good profile or a good website or whatever, depending on you know, what medium you're using and how you're reaching out to them. Make sure that what they're going to see is going to, to support your authority and expertise. But when it does, people are very likely to connect. I mean, 
our clients see, I just actually talked with a client today who's from France and she was telling me, yeah, I'm getting anywhere from 40 on the low side to 60 and 70% acceptance rate. So for every, you know, hundred people that she's sending connection requests to, she's having minimum 40 of them, but even up some cases, 70 of them accepting her connection requests. And these are ideal clients. Where else can you create a connection with an ideal client at that level? That's awesome. How do you move that from there to say like the next stage, I would guess would be like a call? Because again, this would be the next piece. I know this is really minutia, but I'm really curious about that. Like, okay, you've connected in a way you've actually been personal or personable and you know, you're not just spamming people, which I applaud the strategy, by the way, big fan, but moving that then to the call, is that like the next stage? And, and how do you, how do you progress something naturally in that way? Yeah. I mean, once, so once you've established a little bit of a kind of rapport or a bit of a relationship, you've had a bit of a conversation that's actually very natural, right? A lot of people worry about that. Like, well, how am I going to move them from a conversation to having a call with them or a meeting with them? Like it should be pretty natural because you've already had a bit of a back and forth. You've probably asked them like, well, you know, what are they working on right now? Or how are things going? Or how's their summer going or whatever it might be. And there's been a bit of back and forth. And now it's very easy to mention, Hey, I saw that you guys are doing this. I've actually worked with these companies before. I've been doing this for X number of years. A couple of like results or things are done include this. You know, are you working on anything like that right now? Like if you are, I'd be happy to, to share some, some ideas with you or some case studies, some best practices. Like if they're an ideal client, they're going to probably say yes to that because they're interested. If they're like, no, no, we're all good. Don't need any of that. Now, you know, they're not probably ready right now. It's okay. You just, you nurture them. They might be ready later on and you move right to the next person kind of in the pipeline. And then do you have any recommendations in terms of like, uh, I guess for lack of a better way to, to describe it or term for it, um, like kind of, let's say it's like, no thanks or not interested or not right now, or, or just you get the ignore, you've been ignored, um, which will happen to a percentage no matter what. Anything that you do to re-engage later or try to maintain some sort of communication if like that first request or whatever to connect like on a call kind of doesn't go through? Two best practices. One is don't just kind of you know, let them off the hook, quote unquote, right then and there because there might still be opportunity to further engage with them. Oh, that's great. What are you working on right now? Right. Or that's great. What are your priorities right now? Find out maybe there's some other way that you can support them or refer them to someone else. Right. Add value. And that's really the second thing, too, is add value. Right. Have a long term mindset. Too many people these days, I think, are are focused on short term transactions instead of understanding that it's all about the long term. Right. Like, yes, you need to you might want to be making money right now, but the more value that you can provide, the more that you can give before trying to get the greater the benefit you're going to actually see, the, the larger the dividends will be for you down the road. And when you're doing this consistently, the nice thing is that you always have a smaller percentage of the market, but a percentage of the market that is ready to buy from you right now. The majority won't be ready to buy from you right now. But if you know that, if you expect that, and if, as long as you nurture them and continue to add value and stay top of mind, when they are ready, then they will raise their hand. And because you're doing this consistently, it means there's always going to be people at different stages in the pipeline who will be ready to buy right now, who will be ready to buy you know, a few weeks, months, years later. You average that out, you kind of look at that over a longer timeline. And it means you're always going to be having hands coming up saying, yeah, I'm interested or, hey, I'm ready to talk with you. I love it. Well, Michael, man, fast and furious, but we got through a lot. This is one of those podcasts where I think some people have to, I will personally have to go back and listen through it again just to take some, some even better notes. But thank you so much. This is a great deep dive. I think it'll be useful for anybody who's listening to actually implement this, which is fantastic. But now I want to give you the floor. If people are interested in following up, like have more questions about this, interested in kind of what you guys do, maybe even connecting with you or working with you, where can they go? Consultingsuccess.com. I love it. Well, Michael, thank you so much for being on In the Trenches. Thanks so much, Tom. Really appreciate it. And that wraps up another broadcast of In the Trenches. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please do me a favor and go to tomworkus.com slash iTunes. That's T-O-M-M-O-R-K-E-S dot com slash iTunes and leave a rating and review for In the Trenches. Not only do I read and appreciate every review, but it helps spread the word of this podcast and allows me to continue to get on great guests. So thank you for your support. And